Good morning, everyone. It is definitely good to see some of the some friendly faces from our neighboring Ecclesia, Edmonton, and, and Denver as well this morning. And uh, I understand uh, Aloy was uh, unfortunately not able to be with you yesterday. I understand that had quite a, a full menu of of talks and discussions and up to this point, and uh, that is that is good. We've been talking, uh, Brother Dave, in his address this morning, was talking about being different, and uh, we want to continue, I guess, along that that theme and explore, um, you know, what some of the people who are brought up to our attention in Scripture uh, that definitely were different, um, how they did it, and how they were successful at it. And uh, the probably the biggest example, the greatest example we have, is the one that we're here to remember this morning. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. He was different. And he was so different that they put him to death for it. That's because human nature has a lot of problem tolerating people that are different. And so those are some of the problems that we'll run up against as well. We have to understand what it takes to um, to confront that uh, within ourselves. How to confront the the intolerance when we are different from others, and how to be able to be okay with that. And it means forming practices in life, lifestyles, and you know, we, we call them habits, and we're, we're going to continue along the, the theme that we've been um, talking about, and uh, we've been on this subject for quite a while already, and we'll be on it for quite a while longer, uh, but we will be able to uh, explore this a little bit further, and there's definitely uh, some things here that, that maybe will be over the heads of some of us who are younger, but I think there's quite a bit of mixed material here, and there'll be some things even for the younger ones that, that will be uh, interesting for them. I've, I haven't uh, rewritten it, but it's definitely probably through the uh, 14th or 15th edit. Keep adding things to it and changing things. But when we talk about habits, uh, you know, of course, sometimes it all it almost is a kind of a negative thing in our mind because uh, being human and having human nature, habits uh, are sometimes, well, we just tend to form negative habits. We do what is natural to us and what comes natural to us and that becomes habit. And some, so a lot of, you know, we form a lot of bad habits through life. There's no doubt about that. What we're talking about here is the formation of, uh, of good habits, of godly habits, of the kinds of things God wants us to do. Now, what part of our body are we talking about when we talk about habit? What part of our body? We're, we're talking about our brain, are we not? It really is talking about our brain. We're, when we form habits, we form neuron pathways in our brain. And uh, so... Just uh, before we get started, we'll just go through the what uh, what a habit is. First of all, it's brought to our attention right in the Bible. In Hebrews 5, it says, Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, those who are independent, and those who aren't affected by what people around them think. That's really what that means, who are mature and who are able to dedicate themselves to what they know to be right rather than being swayed around by the thoughts and opinions and teasing of others. So it belongs to those who are like that, of full age. Even those who by reason of use, and that word use in the Bible, in the Greek, uh, that was their Greek word for habit that was used there. Who by reason of habit have their senses, their, their brain pathways exercised to discern both good and evil, to know the difference 
to be able to differentiate. So it means, uh, from the Greek, there is the Greek word right there. And the Greek word hexos means habit. That is, by implication, practice. The continual repetition. Doing it over and over. You know, that's why it's good to... We keep doing this. We keep... Uh, for those who kind of come into this midstream, as it were, we have to form context. So we go back and kind of review a little bit. But that's not bad. Because if we keep doing this and doing this and doing this, finally, it almost starts to become habit. These, these thoughts about what, what habit is. We understand it. And it becomes habit to think that way. So, habit occurs at the intersection. You know what an intersection is? is where roads come and they cross and they divide and that forms an intersection. It's a hub. And it, habit occurs at the intersection of knowledge. You have to have knowledge. You have to know what you want to do. You know, And you have to have the the skill, the ability to do it. And finally, you have to have the desire. Without the desire, you'll never, ever form a habit. And that's why uh, you know, bad habits are so easy to form because the desire is so strong. And then all we need is the knowledge and the skill. And we've got a habit. And that's why in good things, because of the human nature we possess, the desire side of it is weak. And so that has to be bolstered. But that's where it occurs, right at that right at that intersection. And we see that right here, you got habit. Right where all those things cross. And was as we said, this is something that, that occurs in the brain. And it's really interesting when we when we look at our brain. Um, we have here the uh, a little illustration of the brain. This is the, the external part of it, and this is the inside of it. And remember where we went, uh, how we got here. Um, we went from a word that occurs in the Bible, it means center. And this is right at the center. All the area of brain activity that is associated with the form of formation of habits is at the little part of the brain called the basal ganglia. Right at the very center. It kind of goes around in a circle here. And it goes around an area that has to do with memory. And also memory is, to, here's our, our hard drives and our RAM memory right up here where we go into short-term memory where, you know, when somebody asks you a question, you're able to remember it uh, long enough to know you get the answer in context. You know what the answer is in context with. That's your RAM memory. You're linking it to a computer. Then it goes into more uh, long-term memory, uh, the hard drive, and finally archive. You archive it. And that's where your really long-term memory, and that's where your, your habits are um, centered in, in a lot of that, a lot of the long-term memory. So it's a, it's a combination of those of those two areas, the basal ganglia and the temporal lobe, has to do a lot with memory. And you know, also notice that it's very close to the area where the emotions are. And you know, uh, habit has a lot to do with how you feel. If it feels good, you're going to do it over again, aren't you? It has a lot to do with the emotions. So it, it, it's kind of a crossover there. You know, desire causes a release of chemicals in the brain. And this can be good or bad. Most often, in human nature being what it is, it's used in, in bad senses with substance abuse and uh, alcohol abuse and uh, pornographic material and that kind of thing. It causes the release of these chemicals, adrenaline, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin. And, of course, in the, in the cases of... of um, pornographic material, testosterone as well. So it, it, it creates a really deadly cocktail there that causes a, a, a desire to repeat and repeat and, of course, in the case of some bad habits, offend and offend and re-offend. And it becomes addiction. But, we, as I said, we need to turn this around. We don't always want to think in the bad sense because God, nobody knows our brain better than God does. 
And God has told us that we need to form habits that are in accordance with his will. And we also need to become addicted to what he wants. Paul used the word addicted. He says, I beseech you, brethren. He says, and you know, he draws an example here. He says, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And that is the word that was used by the Greeks in both the bad and the good sense. And how it applies here is relative to how we use it. And it was by Paul used in a good sense. They have addicted themselves. In other words, the desire was so strong and the knowledge was there and the ability was there and they used that to form a good habit and to become addicted to that. So as I said, it's associated with memory and it's associated with emotions. There was, uh, I think there's just another link there I just wanted to take you to. There's some really interesting facts about our brain. Did you know Did you know that your brain represents only about 2% of your total body weight? 2%. It's a huge, massive computer, but it represents about 2% of your body weight, so it's very effective. It does a lot for its size. But it uses approximately 20% of the total oxygen pumping through your body. Very dependent on oxygen, and that's why you get all kinds of hallucinations as soon as you start depriving it of oxygen. It triggers a whole lot of neural impulses that work to cause hallucinations and all kinds of visions and different things. And that can happen through alcohol abuse or through hypoxia where you, you don't get enough oxygen and all kinds of different things, certain drugs. All your thinking is done by electricity and chemicals. In fact, if you could harness the electricity used by your brain, you could power up a 10-watt 10 10 watt light bulb. Now, the nerve cell that sends and receives electrical signals is called a neuron. Your brain consists of about 100 billion of them. That's about 166 times the number of people on the planet, and it would take you approximately... 3,171 years to count them all. So start now if you want to do it. Your brain is capable of having more ideas than the number of atoms in the known universe. And that's, if you want to kind of put a figure on that, it would be like putting a, a number four followed by 79 zeros. That's how many ideas your brain, this computer that's in your head, is capable of having. That's what it's capable of having. I guess the question is, how well are we using it? And also the number of internal thought pathways. And these are the thought these are the pathways that form habit. And you know, in, in good and bad directions, along with a whole lot of other things. The number of internal thought pathways that your brain is capable of producing is, and again we're going to try and put a number to this. It's like the number one followed by 10.5 million kilometers of standard typewritten zeros. It's a little mind-boggling, isn't it? But what a fantastic thing that God has given us. When you put it into perspective. He just wants us to use it. So when he said to the, uh, when God said to the Israelites, these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, at, at your center, right up in that centermost part of this, this incredible human computer we have in our heads. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. They would have them in front of them all the time. 
They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. You are to have them in front of you all the time. And what was the purpose of that? It was to form habit and memory. And it was to form a desire. It was to give them the knowledge and the ability. Now, there's been some research done about um, habits. And this research was done by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And just a couple excerpts from it here that bring to your notice. And uh, this, this research paper said, Habits help us through the day, eliminating the need to strategize about each tiny step involved in making a frothy latte or driving to work or other complex routines. Bad habits, though, can have a vice-like grip on both mind and behavior. They are notoriously hard to break. They are devilishly easy to resume, as many reformed smokers discover. A new study in October 20th, 2006, of just last fall, um, now shows why. Important neural activity patterns in a specific region of the brain change when habits are formed. Change again when habits are broken, but, and this is the point here, but quickly reemerge when something rekindles an extinguished habit, routines that originally took great effort to learn. Now that's bad if it's a bad habit, but how good would it be if it's a good habit? You know, and, and maybe you lost it temporarily and then you just get the signals again and, and that good habit just bubbles right, right back to the surface. And this is, this is the, what God would like to see us, this is where he would like to see us go. Now one of the researchers says here, we knew that neurons can change their firing patterns when habits are learned. But it is startling to find that these patterns reverse when habit is lost, only to recur again as soon as, soon as something kicks off the habit again. The patterns in question occur in the basal ganglia, which is that little part right in the middle of the brain that we pointed out just a bit earlier. A brain region that is critical to habits, addiction, and procedural learning. We try to simulate the learning and forgetting of a habit, the researcher says. If a learned, if a learned pattern remains in the brain after the behavior is extinguished, Maybe that's why it's so difficult to change a habit. It is as though somehow the brain retains a memory of the habit context, and this pattern can be triggered if the right habit cues come back. This situation is familiar to anyone who is trying to lose weight or control a well-ingrained habit. Just the sight of a piece of chocolate cake can reset all those good intentions. And... We're all human. We know the truth of this. We do know the truth of this. But the secret is, you know, try to form the good habit. Try to get these these neuron patterns going in the right direction. And, you know, to do that, and I guess this, if, there's no test at the end of this, but this is something I'd like you to remember. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. And this is the big message to us because it gets so difficult when you get to be my age and Brother Steve's age and Brother Dan's age. But it gets so difficult to, to form these, neur these new neuron pathways. But it's so easy to do when you're young. So God knows the brain. He knows what he was talking about. And he knows... He knows what he was saying when he said to you to remember him in the days when you're young. Remember him when you're young. Do this when you're young. And you'll form these pathways that, that will have this, this kind of action. That, that even if you do get away from it for a bit, as soon as the, the right cue comes along, you'll be right back on track. So that's where we're going with this, exploring this. And... Um, We've, we're, we're working right now on this one, this number one here, going from dependence to independence, and that is all about being different because 
and 99% of the world today are are in the dependence mode. We want to try to work towards the independence mode, that, and uh, and actually not only that, but interdependence, where we become independent and then progress from there to being interdependent. And that's a big step, but it can be done, at least in measure. So we're working on that, exploring what it takes, and we're working on this this. This first one, be responsible, or you break that down, be response-able. Be res- able to respond. That's a great habit to have. And we'll look at what that means. We have been looking at what it means. It means being proactive. In other words, it's a little bit like even though you're, you're teased and uh, you're bullied, it means being able to be okay with that. Like Daniel did, even though he knew it would probably cost him his life to continue praying to his Heavenly Father uh, in the window of his dwelling, he still did it. Because he knew it was the right thing to do. And he made that a habit and a practice. The This term proactive is a very recent term. Uh, it was actually coined uh, about nine, in around about the 1950s uh, by a psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist. And he described a person there in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he described a person who took responsibility for his or her life rather than looking for causes, uh, things to blame for uh, on the outside, thing, external things or external people, people external to himself. Much of this theory was formed when he was in a Nazi concentration camp where he lost his wife, his mother, his father, and his family, but decided, made the choice, and that's what proactive means, made the choice that even under the worst circumstances where that was all happening to him, people can find, can make and find meaning. And he did. And he survived. Because he said, no matter what you do to me, You'll never take away my smile. You can't take that away. You can't take away my choice to feel joy. That's a decision I can make, and you can't take that away from me, no matter what you do. And that is the the idea behind being proactive. So it it means being able to respond. It means the ability to choose your response. It means recognizing that the person you are today, and this is so important to all of us, and we've gone through, we're just kind of bringing those up to date on this without being here. It means that you know that you are where you are today because of the choices you have made. You can't blame it on external circumstances or other people. It's choices that you have made. Now, things happen to you that you can't avoid. But it's how you respond to them that brings you to where you are today. So, you need to be able to honestly and deeply say that I am where or what I am today because of choices I made yesterday. It does not mean that you have control over what happens to you. Sometimes we're in these situations where we can't control what happens to us. A bowling ball is just bearing down on us. We can't get out of the way. You can't steer it. But it does mean we have control over how we feel about that. We can still make a choice. This principle of responsibility is so extremely important. It's, it's really connected with the very basic reason why we are here on this earth. Why God created human beings with free will. Because it is that ability to make choice in our lives that gives glory to Him. He doesn't want robots. He doesn't want people that just are automatons that that will, when something happens they automatically respond or react, I should say, not respond but react to what happens in a certain given way programmed he wants us to be able to stop and think 
and make a choice. We did a, an exercise where we, we imagined ourselves as um, as being in a corner of the room. Just just to, you know, use your imagination. The imagination is not big. It's not heavy. It can go and and sit on the speaker there or whatever it is. That's your imagination. You can take yourself there and imagine you're up there looking down on yourself. And you're seeing yourself sitting where you are and thinking what you're thinking. Your imagination has that ability to do that. It can see what you're thinking. And you need to, you know, can you see yourself reading or listening or maybe getting a little bit bored with what you're hearing or whatever. And then ask why. You have to think about your mood. Can you identify the mood you're in? How would you describe it? Do you feel quick and alert or are you torn through the, between going through this uh, process of doing this exercise or just getting on with it? On to the next point. These are all, every one of us are different. But you have that ability to take yourself apart from yourself almost into another place. Look down on yourself and say, you know, why am I doing this? What am I thinking? And these are tools that God has given us. They're the tools of self-awareness, which is the ability to think about and examine our very own thought processes. And our imagination, the ability to create in our minds beyond our present reality. And our conscience, the deep inner awareness of right and wrong. And that all comes from, from this side of our, this area of our brain. This is the, and, and this would be of course on the, on the right side of the brain. This area on the right side, the right frontal lobe and the right prefrontal lobe. The creative side. And that's where all that, that, kind of thing, self-awareness, imagination, conscience, and independent will comes from. And for those uh, of, of these ecclesias that were here, we, we went through the process of looking at all these scriptural quotations in reference to these three things. I won't, I won't go through that again, but we didn't do this part about independent will. And the, the independent will is this ability to act based on our self-awareness, based on our ability to think about and examine. The scriptures talked to us many times about self-examination. Examine yourselves. And that is using that process of self-awareness. So it's, And then we have to use this independent will, the ability to act based on that examination, free of all other influences, like the influence of old habits that are out of harmony with what we know to be right. Scriptures have some quotations on that subject. In Joshua, um, the people were being given a choice. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or, on the other hand, are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that was there a choice being made based on the conscience, upon self-examination, using the self-awareness process of looking down on ourselves and, and you know, knowing what we're thinking, understanding what we're thinking. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was the choice that came out of that. I don't care. This is being different. This is being different from all the others that were probably wanting to serve the other gods, gods of their fathers. next one is in Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 26. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews is, is calling to attention some examples out of the past. Here he's talking about Moses. When Moses was come to years, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. This is being different. And again, it's based on self-examination, being aware of himself and being aware of his conscience, what that dictated, and using those tools to 
through the process of independent will, make the right choice, regardless of what others might think about it. So he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And, you know, ancient Egypt, those pleasures were, were really something. But he let that go. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, the real reward, the unseen reward that was still so far yet future to Moses. But that's what he chose, because he knew that to be right. That's the exercising of independent will. That's a tool we have. The writer of the Proverbs said, Let your eyes look right on. Let your eyelids look straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. That's the advice he gives. And again, he's encouraging there the exercise of independent will based on what we know to be right. It'll make us different. Yes. But we have to be okay with that. Christ said, in, in, as recorded in Matthew, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And how different does that make us if we were to follow that advice? How far apart does that set us from the rest of the world around us? That word love is right in line with, uh, this is the Bible word for love, right in line with independent will. Because it means embracing especially the judgment and the deliberate assent of the will as a matter of principle, duty, and propriety. That's that word that's translated love here that Christ is using. And it means doing what we know to be right even though our, our natural impulses might be to do something else. So that is independent will. The ability to act based on our self-awareness, free from all other influences. We have to cast these off, as Paul says. It was, it was baggage. It was dumb. All these other things that, that tend to draw us in. Things of the, of the world. So, until we take into account how we see ourselves, you know, using those tools that God has given us of self-awareness, and how we see others, too. Until we take into account how we see ourselves and how we see others, we, we really will not be able to understand how others see and how they feel about themselves and their world, world and, and their circumstances. It is impossible to affect or change, cause change in someone else. We can't change another person. It is impossible. But what we can change is ourself. And that's where our efforts have to be directed. The gateway to change can only be opened from the inside. That means that, that only you are in control of that gate to change in yourself. And it is you that has to open it and let God in. We also have to learn to define ourselves from within. That is, from the, the basis of divine principles that are internalized. That from what we, we know who we truly are, if we're honest with ourselves. We know, regardless of what somebody else might say about us, and you know, they went through that exercise with you. Are, you. are you teased or are you bullied for what you know, what you believe? And that can really only have an effect when you, deep down inside of yourself, will agree, yeah, maybe I am inferior, maybe I'm, maybe different isn't good. You know, you go and agree with that. 
But if we don't do that, if we stick to what we know, stick to what we know, who we are, who we really are, and don't go, as the proverb said, to the right hand or to the left of that. Let our eyes look straight on. Then that really will not have an effect on us. The social mirror will have no effect. What do we mean by the, the social mirror? Well, that's all those things that that is a reflection of ourselves from the opinions and perceptions and, and paradigms of people around us. How they see us. And how they see us can so deeply affect sometimes how we see ourselves because as I said, we will agree with that. And we shouldn't. The social mirror is, is really a figure of speech that refers to the impact that public opinion and perception have on us. Now, if the only vision that we have are of ourselves comes from that source, from that mirror, uh, from that paradigm, from the opinions and from the perceptions that, that others have about us, our, our view of ourselves will be something like uh, what we see when we look at our, at our reflection in a distorted mirror. And I think we've all had that experience. You know, we come and stand up in front of a distorted mirror. Well, is that really the, is that the real you? Just looking back at you. But essentially we're doing that when we agree with what people are saying about us. Or when we allow it to affect us. That's really what we're saying. Yeah, this probably is me. And that's when it can be really hurtful. And when it, well, devastating. You know, statements like, you're never on time. Why can't you ever keep things in order? You never clean your room. You eat like a horse. This is so simple. You never get it right. Those are really distorted statements. I mean, the, even probably the most uh, retarded person will still be on time some of the times. To say that you're never on time is an inaccurate statement for almost anybody. You know how many times you're on time. Maybe you were late once. And this person is coming at you and say, you're never on time. Now, you can feel bad by agreeing with them. Well, I guess I'm, yeah, that probably is me. But you know, if you really know yourself, how many times you were late when you were on time. And you just stick to that. You know who you are. You know how you work in keeping things in order or keeping your room clean. Maybe you don't clean your room sometimes. But to say that you never do it is not really an accurate statement, but that's what lots of people like to do to us. What we're trying to say here is that the the visions that these statements project, they're exaggerated, they're, they're disjointed, and they're out of proportion, much like this, this mirror. Some things there are, are correct, like the colors are right, but a lot of the things are not right about us. So these statements are, are really coming from immature people who are trying to, to get their fix, their maturity, from you. They're trying to take that from you. They're getting, they're getting power from you. By making you feel bad, that's how they can feel good. They make themselves feel better by putting others down. And we often react to these statements rather than by taking a deep breath and reflecting on where such statements have come from and then putting them in their rightful context. We have to choose reality, what is real. Certainly we have things that we need to improve ourselves in and we have a lot of work to do on that but we have to not let people bring us down it is okay to be different we have to follow what we know to be right regardless of what people say we cannot react to the social mirror same thing about our looks we always want to do and conform to what is going on around us. It is okay to be different and not to be bothered by people 
projecting a distorted statement. That is because we choose not to follow what all the others are doing around us. There's three things, and we'll conclude with, with this, looking at this. There are actually three social mirrors or maps that are widely accepted to explain the actions of people. There's number one is what they call genetic determinism. And this basically says that, and this is not right, by the way, but this is what is used a lot. This says that who you are and what you are is largely on account of your grandparents or your great-grandparents or your great-great-grandparents. It's in your genes. They did it to you. That's where your weaknesses come from. It's in your DNA. And that's, that excuse is still put out by a lot of people, that paradigm. The second one is psychic determinism. This basically says that your parents did it to you. And therefore you're not responsible for what you're doing because that's the way I was brought up. The way you are and how you act is largely on account of your childhood experience. So I can't help it. It's how I was brought up. That's an excuse. It's not a reason. Because what you're really saying is that you have no control. You can't make a choice. Same thing with genetic determinism. You can't make a choice. Then there's another one called environmental determinism. This basically blames your behavior on things external to you. The, you, the environment around you. Your boss, your spouse, your kids, your economic situation, your parents, or even on national policies, the government. Something or someone in your government is responsible for, for your situation. So, I'm not responsible. Can't do anything about it. You can. You can make a choice. If nothing else, you can make a choice of how you feel about it. And that you're going to be happy anyway. And that you're going to go on doing what you know to be right anyway. People are going to... Uh, trample on, on the good things you do, I'm going to do it anyway. doesn't matter. So the basic idea behind each of these paragrams is that we are conditioned to respond in a certain way to a certain stimulus. And they do become self-fulfilling prophecies because if we do think that way, it will happen. And we will respond that way. And so we have to stop. We have to break the cycle they know I am responsible for my own actions. I don't care what it is, how, how it was brought up, what my DNA is, what government is in place, what the weather is like. I can still go ahead and do what I know I need to do and what I know to be right anyway, in spite of it. So, we could go on. Um, the, this idea of the capacity to pause between stimulus and response is basically just saying that, for those who won't be here for the, for the next time, it's just saying that there is we can put a space between what is happening to us and how we are reacting to it. We can just say, stop. I'm just going to stop here. I'm going to think about what I'm going to do. Somebody calls me a name, I don't, I can just react and call them a name back. Or I can stop and say, no, that's not right. I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm going to choose to ignore it. And that's an ability that we as humans have, with this brain we have, that the animal kingdom around us does not have. And that's the ability to put this space between what happens to us and how we react to it and respond to it and make a choice. This is the, some of the things that, that Christ was doing through his life. And we know how, when he went through the temptations in the wilderness, how quick he was to just respond right on the button with the, the right hope from the word and the instructions of his heavenly father to defeat that impulse, that temptation that he had. It was right on the button with it. It was right at the forefront of his mind. That's where we, we can never get there in the same uh, capacity that he was. But that's the example we're following. That's where we're, 
That's where we're heading to. That's where we're, we're where we would like to be. And to be able, in spite of what was happening to him, the crowds, the uh, the armies coming to take him away at the end of his of his uh, ministry, and in spite of that, all that happening around him to say to his heavenly Father, "Not my will, but thine be done." That was a choice that he made. Not a reaction, but a response to what he was happening, what was happening around him. <coughs> 